Thank you. Okay, cheers everybody before we get into this. Um, spy subsystem, um, my name's Matt Porter, as he said, and let's just jump into it. So, um, oops, of course now it quits working. How about that, huh? Well, it worked just a second ago. <laughs> All right. Next time you throw it Exactly. <laughs> All right. We'll do it manually. All right. All right, just to uh, de-obfuscate the name of the thing, our community has gotten more diverse, so people might not get Heinlein references, so we're gonna understand intuitively the spy subsystem, ho hopefully, uh, by the time we get done with this. So if you haven't read it, read Stranger in a Strange Land. Awesome book. All right, little overview. We'll talk about what SPY is, okay? We'll go over some SPY fundamentals because we can't truly understand the subsystem unless we really understand how SPY works first. So we've got to go through that first. Um, we'll talk about some fundamental Linux SPY concepts, um, so how the subsystem takes the concepts of, of SPY itself, translated into the Linux world. Um, and we'll look at some use cases to kind of drive us through the subsystem, right? Adding a, adding a device, um, doing a protocol driver, we'll talk about what that is, how that relates to um, the real world of SPI, controller drivers, user space drivers, and then we'll talk a little bit about performance and then what's coming up in the future. Uh, all right, so getting into what SPI is. Um, so serial peripheral interface, um, Motorola uh, developed this. Um, it's a de facto standard, so if you're hoping for a written spec with a committee, um, you won't find it here. Um, it's a master-slave bus, um, four wires, and we'll talk a little bit about the signals coming up here, except when it's not. So, <laughs> um, four wire sounds like the easy case, Everybody talks about the standard case, but there's a few others. We'll, we'll get into those a little bit. Um, yeah, options where you don't need to use all the wires and so forth, or use more. So um, there's no maximum clock speed. Um, obviously, there's practical limits that, that chips uh, run into. Um, but uh, then this really poorly formatted uh, uh, URL is obviously the usual place you can go get some information on it. So um, if I lie about anything, you can go there and find the truth, hopefully. <clears throat> so, and one of the jokes about SPY is that everybody makes a big deal about it, but at the end of the day, it's just a glorified shift register. All right, so what are some common uses? Where do we see SPY used? Well, pretty much everywhere, but just to highlight a few of them, um, you have uh, things like flash memory. Um, you guys often find serial flash um, devices. Uh, why do we do that? Uh, why do people design those in that way? Low pin count, right? Same reason you see I square C EE proms, right, for your non vowel storage. Huge advantage with that low pin count in embedded systems. So, um, again, same reasons drive its use with uh, analog digital converters. Um, a number of different sensors. Um, thermal couples, for example, you might say, well, what's, I mean, that's just a temperature sensor. I know that there's lots of I2C ones and they're low speed, right? But in industrial use and so forth, um, things like um, uh, thermal couples have to be sampled at very, very high rates of speed, right, in a process control that uh, has uh, um, very little deviation a lot, uh, permitted in the temperature. Um, LCD controllers, um, you start seeing a theme here, right? And of course, as we saw this morning, the, uh, the chromium embedded controllers um, can use SPI as one of the, the uh, communication channels. Um, one of the themes here when we look at all of these, okay, is that um, they're all 
fairly high speed um, type devices, right? ADCs, thermocouples in the kind of uh, sense I gave where it would be sampled very quickly. LCD controllers can have um, a very high rate of, of speed if they're, they're a, uh, a color controller and so forth. All right, so now that we've got that little overview out of the way, let's hit our fundamentals. Um, so we start with our standard signals. And here it can get a little bit ugly when you're looking at data sheets. And we're going to talk a little bit about data sheets and translating those into some reality of, of uh, extracting the information you need out of them. But um, you start with MOSI, as, as I pronounce it, master out, slave in. And what I show here is you're going to find a lot of different um, names for this. Because it's a de facto standard, every manufacturer uh, vendor seems to have picked some different things. And I've even seen data sheets where um, they'll show I2C names right, for the data in a, in a half duplex type device. So that's why SDA is on there as well. So you'll see all these. It depends on the vendor. Um, same thing uh, with master input, uh, slave output. Um, you'll see that same set of things. And then your um, serial clock. OK, that's an output from the master. Um, you'll see those kind of different uh, monikers for it. And then you have the concept of a slave select. Uh, that is a, a master output. And so that's how a spy device is actually selected, should there be more than one on the bus. OK, so clock, you have uh, output and input. OK, and so that's the four wires we talked about. That's our common case, right? And keep in mind, as you see this, that if we've got a dedicated channel for output and a dedicated channel for input, it's a full duplex protocol by its very nature. So this is what it looks like in our really, really trivial example, right? Um, so we got our spy master. Um, we got our flows for each of those. Um, and uh, if you want to do a transaction, um, he would go ahead and assert uh, assert this slave select low, right? And say he wants to do a write, he would uh, put data on there and clock that, OK? Now, we're going to look in detail how, how that works, because you can't verbally explain it and give it justice. So let's look at some timing, OK? And with these wonderful timing diagrams that Wave DROM helped me do, um, we'll look at, and don't worry about write mode zero yet. We'll explain modes, OK? Um, but we have a, a typical write cycle in, in zero. And so what you're seeing here is um, just a, an 8-bit transfer, OK? And in this case, um, what is usually, usually the de facto standard is um, MSB first on the wire. So that's why you're seeing D7 down here. And um, so what you see is you see the data stable here. Boy, I can't really hold this. I must be nervous, huh? <laughs> no, it's just hard. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so as you'll see, um, it's latching that data on the rising edge is what we're showing there in a right. OK? And you see it on the ma master out slave input. Makes it easy with the name if you use those signals to know um, which direction you're going there. Um, and then on the read case, OK, you have it latching on the rising edge here. And you can see that this chip select went low right, before that first edge for that bit. All right. So that's your very basic case. All right. We'll get to the modes here in a second. <clears throat> and here we are. So spy modes, um, you have lots of options. So there are many modes. But it's a pretty simple tooth table. Um, the way it breaks down is you compose it of, of two characteristics of your, of your clocking all right, relative to the data. All right, so um, you will see uh, CPOL is, is the abbreviation you'll typically see for clock polarity um, in most data sheets and, and in the original spy uh, description from, from Motorola. And then uh, C phase, uh, the clock phase. And so right here, we see um, how those break down. So um, 
if the player if the polarity is zero or C pole is zero, then your idle state or your clock is low, right? And so it's it's uh, transitioning from low to high um, in the active state, all right? And then the inverse is true if you if C pole is one. Um, so that allows options on the clock polarity for devices. And then in the phase, um, very simple. Some people forget it, but your data your data is latched on falling if C phase is zero. Okay, and the out and then its output on rising, um, and then uh, on uh, on one, it's latched on rising. So this is going to vary on the type of peripherals you deal with and so forth. So you end up having to program your controller to um, operate with the proper phase for whatever peripheral you want to talk to. And so what they've come up with is a way to encode these. That's a de facto standard as well that simply modes zero through three. So if you're used to seeing mode zero through three, that's how they translate back, all right? It's simply just telling you what polarity of the clock and what phase I'm latching data on, okay? All right, so now let's look at these modes, right? I showed you the basic example. It was, write, it was writing and reading in mode zero, okay? So now let's look at each, each individual. We'll just look at write just because it doesn't matter for, for illustration of, of this concept, okay? So what you see first, right, is our chip selects going low, all right, to activate the chip, right, at this edge here. Don't care what the data looks like here, all right? And then I have my first clock edge, and so this is just like, this is the original example we looked at, okay? And so you see it's latching data on each rising edge, and notice that it was, it was uh, idle low, right, the clock. So that would be the clock um, polarity zero, right? And then the phase, right, rising is where it's latching. So then we go, we still have clock idle low in mode one, if you remember our truth table there, whoops. So when we're looking at one, we're just changing the phase, right? And so now, you see that instead of, <clears throat> instead of um, latching on the rising edge, it's latching on this falling edge here each time. You see how that lines up with each stabilized data bit, okay? And then when we go to write mode two, all right, now, now C pole is one, right? So our clock is idle high. So that's why you see this waveform, it's high, and now we're, you know, going to a falling edge, okay? And um, in this case, I show falling edge, right? Falling edge uh, latched there. Remember, they're all right, so that's why it was mosey. And down the line, same thing here, except in mode three, it's on rising edge, right? So that's all the modes, okay? All right, so, but we only looked at this really trivial example, right? single slave and so forth. Now it gets complicated because we live in the real world. So first off, obviously we've got, the reason we have the chip select in the first place was so we can have multiple slaves on a bus. Um, and the way to think about a chip select is from a software stance that gives us an address, right? So everything is gonna have a unique chip or chip select in order to activate the chip. chip. <laughs> Yeah, activate its buffers, and uh, so that becomes a convenient abstract way to reference multiple um, multiple slaves on connected to one master. Okay. Um, the next thing, um, the next thing to get complicated is daisy chaining, and um, the very common uh, the very common uh, case uh, that they'll show with daisy chaining is uh, the daisy chaining of the uh, MOSI to MISO on each uh, device. Uh, but there's also um, daisy chaining cases, in fact, the, the Anodyne um, analog, um, field program analog arrays, they do chip select chaining during configuration. So they shift so many bits and then it asserts another chip select. So now you don't have the master controlling the chip select down the line. And so that can get ugly as well. <clears throat> okay, and the next area I promised you there's lots of ways you can abuse the fact that it's a four-wire bus. Well, 
in high-speed flash devices, um, they started adding more lanes, right? Um, more lanes, more throughput, right? So there's a balance there on pin count versus your ability to, to burst read data off your spy flash. And um, so um, we'll see that uh, there's, there's devices that, um, spy flash devices that do dual or quad, quad's popular. Um, so essentially instead of one MISO, we have N number of them, right? And there's nothing preventing, I can't remember if there's some eight, eight lane yet, but it probably goes beyond the point of doing it. And I know that the quad ones are very close to, or right around the parallel NOR flash speed now anyway. <clears throat> so, um, and um, so obviously, like I said, that in increases your throughput. So every time you add another lane like that, all right, and then the last one um, here variant is the three wire variant, microwire. And so what, what they do is they combine MISO and MOSI and it operates in half duplex. Um, you can also do things like say that your peripheral is a write only peripheral, right? Some LCD controllers, that's all they are, right? And you don't, you don't even need MISO hooked up for those if you're not, if you're just caching the contents of the registers and operating from reset. So a lot of designers just won't hook up a pin if they don't need to, to read back from it. So essentially you're back to a three wire bus or maybe it's your only device and you drop the chip select and it's always asserted. So um, there are designs like that as well. All right. So looking at that more complex case, which is really, um, the more common one that you'll run into, um, what you see is the same type of flow, okay? And MOSI, MISO, and the clock are all propagated to all three of these together, right? But you'll see that each one of them has a unique slave select now, or chip select, right? SS1, two, and three. And if you can read this eye chart, so it's hard to fit this stuff on there. Um, so. What you see here you know, um, is uh, this one here, and I know that's probably hard to see. I knew this one was gonna be tough, but that's slave select one, two, and three, and so this is just showing, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, three eight-bit writes, okay, each to each of those um, slaves. And so when you see the timing of that, how you manage that uh, is you drop the chip select, for SS1, it's, this is write mode zero, and so what you're seeing is when that chip select is asserted, you see it latching the data for, for um, the first slave, and then you see slave select two, right? You see that unasserted, that go low, and now slave select two is, is uh, receiving eight bits of data, and the same thing. So that just shows you what it would look like if you were dumping that on your logic analyzer. Okay, we're through that background now, right? So now that we understand those concepts, now we can talk a little bit about the Linux Spy subsystem. <clears throat> so now every subsystem, the kernel has to translate this hardware into some sort of uh, concepts that we can use. And of course, um, with the uh, device model and the kernel, um, the way it's, it's broken out in the, the SPI subsystem is we have a concept of controller and protocol drivers, okay? And those match up one-to-one -one with um, what the controller is that master that we saw, um, and the protocol driver is whatever protocols needed on top of just shifting bytes out to actually do something with your peripheral, okay? Um, and uh, <clears throat> so as I said, the, the controller drivers, that supports the spy master controller. Both of these run on your, your SOC, if you will, okay? And um, all the controller driver does, right? We've, we've, the, the subsystem is very carefully split out that protocol of the peripheral from the actual shifting of bits out of that controller and so forth. So all it's doing is controlling when that clock comes on, when the chip selects are asserted, or slave select, if you will, um, shifting the bits, and then 
configuring those characteristics so that you get the right mode, you get the right frequency of the clock, and so forth, okay? And, and, and of course, the, the polarity and phase, right, as we showed encoded in the modes, all right? So an example would be like for Raspberry Pi 2.3, the uh, 2035 uh, driver. So um, now protocol drivers, as we said, very carefully split that concept away. So you don't, if you're writing a protocol driver, you don't have to think about uh, what is it, what, what, what controller am I on, what are its characteristics, to a point, right? That's all abstracted for you. So um, the way to think about them is that's your slave-specific functionality. So if I've got an ADC, it talks to whatever that ADC says for, these are my registers, this is how I get samples started, and this is how I read them out. That's what you're coding up in a protocol driver. All right, and so fundamentally, um, everything, every, every uh, operation in the SPI subsystem is based on top of the concept of messages and transfers, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about those in, in detail here and, and, and um, really understand that as it relates to the APIs. Um, but that's, that's a fundamental concept they've added that's, that's somewhat you know, outside the realm of that low-level SPI um, hardware, but maps well to how peripherals actually use SPI in, in functionality. Um, so remember, the protocol driver relies on you having a controller driver. It doesn't care what controller driver. Everything's abstracted for you. So an example would be like um, one of these old MCP3008 um, ADCs. So as promised, um, so communication, um, the, the subsystem, of course, it breaks everything up into transfers and messages, okay? And so a transfer, and if you think back to those timing diagrams I'm showing, right, a, a transfer, if say my device wants uh, an 8-bit, uh, it has 8-bit registers that it implements behind it, okay? A transfer might be a single 8-bit read or a single 8-bit write, okay? Uh, in generic terms, it's a single operation between the master and slave, okay? Um, part of the transfer um, data structures, um, it, what's carried in there, remember, it's a full duplex um, wire um, protocol at the low level. So each transfer structure carries um, both TX and RX buffer pointers. So, you know, one, one can be consumed and the other filled, right, within the same operation. You can make either null if you're just doing a half duplex operation, okay? And each transfer can have its own optional uh, parameters set on it. So you can control what happens with the chip select after that operation ends. Okay, um, and that, that matters a lot when you go look at your peripheral data sheet. It may, it may say, oh, you know, you can't drop the chip select um, after, after a, a certain sequence of things. So um, you can go um, per transfer defi um, uh, define how that's going to behave. Um, and then you also may need to insert some delays in there to satisfy the timing. And so there's ability to do that. Okay, now that said, what are messages? Just an atomic sequence of transfers. So when you, just, when you build up a message, you can add N transfers, all of which can have this individual behavior of how they manage the chip select, a delay in between, and so you can build up that message for whatever your peripheral data sheet says. You need this sequence, right? You can build that all up, add the delays and so forth, okay? And so the message itself is the fundamental argument to all the, the SPI subsystem um, transfer calls, the read-write APIs. And there's a bunch, and we'll talk about that. But just to give you an idea, if it wasn't clear verbally, that's the best way to kind of look at a SPI message, right? You got a chain of transfers inside of it, n number of those, pretty simple. All right. so. Let's use some use cases to walk ourselves through the subsystem now. Um, so I want to hook up 
a spy device, right? I've already, I know there's a kernel driver for it, like let's say the MCP 32OX that runs the MPC 3008. But how do I hook the damn thing up and get it working on my board, right? So <clears throat> the next one, I want to write a protocol driver, I want to write a controller driver, right? Or I want to write a user space driver because I don't, I've got something odd or I want to do something different than a kernel driver for some reason or I'm lazy. <clears throat> All right, so adding a spy device to the system. Um, the first thing is you need to know the characteristics of your device. You need to understand the timing of it in order to properly add it in because you're going to have to set some parameters, okay? So learn how to read a data sheet if you're going to do that. Um, you know, even if you're using an off-the-shelf one, if you don't understand what the max frequency is, then you're not going to be able to hook it up right, okay? Um, and uh, so there's three methods to do this. Um, device tree, obviously pretty ubiquitous. Um, so we have it everywhere now. Um, the board file method that's, that's basically deprecated now, except x86 people tend to use it sometimes. Um, and then ACPI, um, which a lot of drivers are getting uh, uh, ACPI ID tables now uh, to, to uh, support that. All right. Wow. So learning to read data sheets, right, for SPY, there's a few important things. <laughs> First off, you might not even notice when you look at the data sheet. Sometimes they don't even say spy, right? And, and they will, they'll just say, ah, it's got a serial interface and you have to kind of go look at it and maybe they're masking because they don't want to say the, uh, the, uh, the Philips I2C name or something, right? So it might be I2C, but you got to look a little bit. Usually they'll say, you know, this is a spy device. So this is a few clippings out of an ST7735 um, LCD controller. And um, what's important, this was one of those examples where, where I was not kidding you, they show SCL and SDA, but it's, it's spy, right, when they show that timing, okay? So, and, and that's also an example of one where I said, you know, if, if you write only like this, since I know this part well, um, you, uh, you have a situation where it's essentially a three-wire uh, setup. You know, there, there's no need to have the, uh, the read path. Uh, it's optional. So they actually show a four-wire hookup as well if you do want to read certain status things, but most designs don't even hook that up. Um, so important things here, <laughs> identify at the beginning it's a spy device, okay, you know, that's pretty obvious. But then, you know, be aware of your timing diagram. You have to be able to read the timing diagrams. They're not much different than the stuff I drew up. Um, they got a lot more detail though, right? So if, if you're a software person that hasn't got comfortable with data sheets, now's the time to do so if you want to do something with, with hardware. Um, so, you know, you need, to, you need to look at things like um, this time here, right, which is the time between where you drop the chip select, right, or you assert it, and when that first clock edge starts, right? And then they're showing things like um, the, uh, uh, the period by this, this high time and low time, right? So now you have the period and thus the frequency. So if you can do simple math, you can figure out what your maximum frequency. So that's generally how they communicate that information to you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and so you'll see, you know, they've got, they've got that uh, <clears throat> setup time, right? And they've got hold times and so forth. And so that's where you get your frequency from. Um, there's a little bit more on that. And then, then what happens is all they were doing in that timing diagram is showing you a very low level, right? So then later you're, you're going to see more information that's actually how their protocol works. So in this, this part, it's got uh, the concept of a, a data or command type state. And so um, you'll find tables like this where now you're talking protocol, okay? Now it's showing me how in this case on the data line, this is a data or command flag. And so everything that's following in that eight bits, okay, is, 
everything following that then is either a command, which could be a register access, right? Or if you're doing data, you may be just streaming your frame buffer, right? If you're using the, the uh, FBTFT stuff or the, the new DRM stuff they're working on for that. Um, so um, this is where you start seeing that. So you need to look for how those registers are mapped and so forth, and that's where you get um, what you need to do the actual protocol driver, the guts of it. All right, so let's look at another example real quick. That's one where it's a, a con, uh, LCD controller. I'm gonna use this example when we go through hooking things up a little bit, um, but uh, again, it tells you, it says, I'm a, I'm a spy device. Somewhere at the beginning of the document, I, these are just clippings I snapshotted out. Again, same type of timing, okay? And they show T high and T low here. Add them together to get your period and you find out that, you know, it, it can do a, a max of four megahertz. Well, nominally, people find that everything works out of spec, but in reality, that's your safe time. So um, same thing there. Um, and again, just reiterating that um, it's one thing, it's one thing to have that low level timing, it's another to go further in the data sheet and you start seeing how, um, how the ADE converter goes, right? When it starts doing its conversion, how soon after that the data is available, and D out here, if you remember, they use, back to, I described the signals and all the different names, that's, that's the MISO, right? That's master in, slave out. So, half duplex, you mean? No, this this is this is a this is a four wire. It's just using um, the alternative naming for the things. So just don't get confused by that. You know, um, if you don't see MOSI and MISO on the data sheet, you know, D out is also MISO, right? That was back on that earlier slide on the signals. All the different crazy names that we see used. Oh, this turned out terrible, huh? Contrast is not good, huh? Well, can, can you guys read that at all? Not really good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you guys can. can turn the lights off first. Yeah, can we turn more of the lights off? Because I think, I think it'll be legible enough. Otherwise, I don't have any examples. <laughs> this is an intimate setting, right? <laughs> okay, so um, this is not grokking DT, so I expect you to know it, but this is just remember where to reference and find information for spy stuff. You go, if you're gonna hook things up, so we're back to let's hook this thing up, right? Via DT, go look at your, go look at the binding, right? Um, documentation, device tree bindings, right? Um, and sure enough, we find um, <clears throat> this, and I clipped a little bit out of this for the example, but one of the compatible strings is microchip MCP3008. Uh, there's some deprecated ones in there as well, but, and then there's a little example of how you would hook it up there. Um, that's for a 3002. We have a 3008. And so let's say, Again, I'm not showing every variant of how you can actually implement this, um, but just as an example, um, a DTS fragment for this device would look something like this. If you don't understand DTS fragments or DT fragments and, and overlays, um, that's a different talk. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the important thing here is that um, in the overlay, the, the operative piece here is that um, this, this reg here is a chip select or your slave select. So that's your unique ID. I said you can use it like an address and that's how the subsystem uses it, okay? You got that compatible string that we saw in the, um, uh, in the binding on the previous slide. And then we figured out what our max frequency was from our data sheet because we're smart and we're gonna plug it in there, okay? So 
four megahertz there. Now, this is how you do it the wrong way. Um, so if you've got a board filer, you're on something like maybe a, a minnow board, right? Typical uh, developer board where you don't have DT handy and ACPI doing, doing uh, 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 overrides is really a, a pain. <laughs> um, you do this type of thing, um, which is it's well documented in the subsystem docs. Um, this is the old way. So normally you'd see in a board port, you also see this this structure and so forth. In the old days, before DT, you'd see all the board files in the kernel registering all their devices this way, right? Um, so um, just in, a, in a, a big array here. Um, so this is just an example of one. Again, same data that we needed, right? We know we're bus number one, um, chip select zero, and this uh, four megahertz rate. And we also need to tell it what module. Doing it by ACPI is almost unreadable, um, as with most ACPI stuff. But um, you see there, basically the same things are there. Um, yeah. it, it mixes a bit up here. Um, you know, you've, you've got the clock polarity and so forth. Um, you've got um, the, uh, the max frequency. It, well, that's, that's this one here. So that's your four megahertz. In, in, well, in machine readable form. So that's what that looks like. So three ways to get there. It just depends on your platform, right? So you'll see these type of constructs on uh, Bay Trail type. If you dump their ACPI, you'll see some of the stuff for spy devices. It looks mysteriously like that. All right. So that's how we hook one up. Basic example. Uh, time check. All right, we're good. Um, so now um, let's talk about a proto protocol drivers. Okay, and um, now we're getting in the meat of things. We're going we're to come back to the whole messages and transfers and and so forth because we're, we're we're now going to use some of that as we get into these. So uh, if I do a protocol driver, um, standard Linux driver model. Okay, you find these same patterns throughout the kernel. Um, so you have to instantiate a struct spy driver, okay? And um, so there's a few important fields, okay? Um, once, once the probe fires, so again, we assume that you know the driver model first off. <laughs> We're not gonna cover all that here, but just as a highlight of what you've gotta fill out to do your protocol driver, okay? You have your optional PM ops that you probably want, and you got a probe and remove, which all standard hooks you're going to find and everything that works in the driver model. Um, the important thing operationally with a spy protocol driver um, is that as soon as, as soon as it probes, you can start using the kernel APIs to do messages. Okay? So, so that's immediate. Um, and so, yeah, so once you implement that probe, um, you can start uh, banging on the device using the in kernel APIs. So what are these APIs? These are the APIs you're going to use to build the protocol driver, right? We, we said the subsystem's carefully architected to separate out that controller thing. So all we have available to us are these neat little transfer um, APIs. So the first is spy async, and it's not really an obfuscated name. It means what it says, right? So that's an asynchronous message request, OK? And when, when that message completes, you get a callback executed, all right? Um, the key with async and when you're using these is that it can be issued in any context. And we'll explain what the other side of that is in a moment, but you can execute that, for example, in an IRQ context since it does not sleep, okay? Now, spy sync, uh, and I will say that when you look, you look at the type of drivers that use spy async, you find it's not heavily used directly, okay? Um, and we'll get back to that in a second, but so now let's talk about spy sync, okay? Again, synchronous message request, right? It does exactly what it says. Um, one thing implementation note is that 
everything, all of these synchronous family uh, calls are all wrapped around spy async, right? So the same backends used, um, but they guarantee a, um, that, that it will return uh, on completion. So um, you can only issue this in a context that can sleep, right? So um, if you need to be in IRQ context, you're going to have to use this guy, okay? Um, and as I already said, it's a wrapper around those. And um, so you can build up uh, complex messages and then issue them with the spy sync, okay? And then there's some helper calls where you can just uh, hand a buffer and do a write and a read. And so those are just wrapped around there. Um, what you'll find is um, you'll see things like um, some of the network drivers will use spy async. Um, they're more optimized around throughput, and so they can, they can drive everything off of callbacks that way. Things that want low latency right, are going to want to use something based off of spy sync. They may have a short little command to send, and they don't want to have some um, arbitrary amount of time and handle the callback coming back. They want to do it sequentially. Then you have some specialized um, APIs. Uh, well. Just this first one. This is kind of out of order, fortunately. So, spy read flash. You've got an API. If you deal with with uh, spy flash devices, they have a a standardized set of commands. Okay, and um, so that's actually optimized um, for that set of commands. It, it's also optimized around specialized engines, um, like some of the some of the quad spy controllers on the newer SOCs. Um, they'll 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 IPL out of that quad spy flash, and so they have memory mapped I/O, and it actually triggers um, uh, spy transactions on the bus by accessing that. So they'll they'll kind of they'll they'll demand page in um, chunks of, of the spy um, of that spy flash device into that MMIO area and execute the code uh, XIP there. Um, <clears throat> so um, that. That supports those, those types of, of things. And then um, when you do need to build up the message, right, we show how you, you have all these transfers, there's, there's APIs to do that. And so not surprisingly, you can spy message init, and that, that initializes the empty message. Right? So you're dealing with that kernel structure. And then you can spy message add tail and just add transfers onto that list that we saw in that diagram earlier. So you can put any arbitrary type of transfers together, different characteristics, how they leave their um, chip select and everything by using that API there. All right. That covers APIs that you're going to use with protocol drivers. With a controller driver, again, standard driver model. Um, not everybody's going to be writing one of these every day, right? Um, usually you're going to be touching protocol drivers for most people. Um, but it works, again, like a lot of other subsystems, right? We have those strong concepts of master, right, a master device. and and also called a controller uh, in the subsystem. And so you're going to spy alloc master. And then once you've done that, you need to um, set a whole bunch of methods, right? And so set up, configure spy parameters, clean up, prepares you for removing the driver. And then you have um, four, four different th that are the meat of it, right? And so one is prepare transfer hardware. Um, so you have to implement. Um, so you, you, you may need to do some prepare, uh, preparation for a message is going. So when the message pump in the, in the core spy subsystem is um, about to send you a message to be processed by your driver, he'll let you know um, before he calls um, a transfer one message, or before, so that you can get ready so you can call transfer one message. So, so you get a hint there that a message is going to arrive into your driver, OK? And um, transfer one message does exactly what it says. You dispatch a message there. So when you get called by that, and then transfer one is just is dispatch a transfer. All right. So you implement all those, and then you you register it with the subsystems by register master. Okay. Um, okay. So user space drivers. Um, 
obviously this is a, a popular one with all the, the developer type boards and the maker community likes to, to do the user space type drivers and, and wiring pi and stuff like that over top of things. The way that's done is through a, a protocol driver, a special one called SpyDev, right, that exposes a simple character device uh, out uh, to user space, okay? So when you bind that SpyDev driver to an actual device, using methods that we showed earlier, okay? You get these instantiated, um, so you have SpyDev and whatever your bus dot your chip select. So that gives you that unique address per bus, remember? And so same thing, you, you'll see, you'll see uh, information on it under, under SysFS, and then you see that character device there. And usage of it is very straightforward. Um, so simple, open, close. You've got um, uh, <clears throat> half duplex read and write commands just by their nature <laughs> using the standard calls. Um, and then if you want to do more complex things, <coughs> yes? Um, um, so half, half duplex and user space, I, I didn't realize that, but what actually happens in that case to the actual transfer, does it just get started, like the other half of it? The, the, so if you look at the actual transfer struct, um, when you're just doing a write, um, it, by being half duplex, that, that just means that you can't set up a full duplex um, transfer yeah. using that API. I mean, on an SPI level, it's always full duplex. Yep. <laughs> Does the other end just get thrown away? Yeah. So that, that would be the case. You, you would do this very commonly even in kernel space where um, you just set, say you want to you wanna do a write, you would set the Rx buffer to null. Right? So that's a common pattern if you were building it up you know, by scratch. And so that's what happens underneath those types of calls. Right? Good question. Um, so to get more complicated, it does, SpyDev does support very complex um, drivers. So to get at that, you have to go beyond read write that aren't sufficient and use your, your uh, IO controls. And so there's a few, um, I don't show all of them here, but the important thing is, and, and you can read the docs on it yourself, but um, the important thing you've got there is the SPI IOC message. You can do raw messages, full duplex, you can, you can control the chip select, everything, and then you have a whole family of read-write IOCs where you can set all the same SPI parameters that you would in the kernel APIs. So you have full control. Um, you can build up complex messages with lots of different transfers, just like you can in kernel space. Best place to go to get more details on that is in that spy dev doc, okay? And then what's great is the kernel has, and, and sometimes people aren't aware, uh, in the tools directory, a couple great examples. So you wanna see that thing used you know, in a raw way. There's a full duplex example. There's a, a test piece that a lot of people use in their examples. Um, and then once you move beyond that, I can recommend uh, Jack Mitchell's uh, LibSock library has a, a higher level. Uh, it fits into his whole LibSock API. So you have a uniform API, makes it easier to work with um, spy dev. Maybe a lot of times you want to use GPIO too if you're doing user space stuff so you have a common API. So that's helpful. It's a, very, very familiar standard C uh, library. Um, and then a, a lot of people, I think Lan and Avi was talking about you know, pi, uh, Python and stuff and the maker community and his talk and um, a lot of people are using this um, Python binding to spy dev. All right. Um, all right, we're almost there. We'll talk a little bit about performance. Um, so, this is all well and good. You got all this abstraction. You've got these standard uh, APIs and everything. But at the end of the day, you need to understand how to use them properly, right? And so um, first thing that happens um, when you have bad performance is you probably miss some characteristic of the controller driver. So we got all this nice separation, but there's always going to be some things that aren't fully abstracted, right? Um, and you find one of those where 
down in the controller driver, uh, the McSpy driver on OMAP that's used on pretty much all the TI parts, right? They actually, they have hard coded because of DMA overhead, it doesn't use DMA until you get beyond the 160 byte threshold, right? So it doesn't use heuristics or anything. So you have to be aware, maybe you're doing a test, um, you know, a, a simple test and you're like, well, why, you know, why is this, you know, taking so long or, you know, you're looking at it and there's the pause, but they're, they're using PIO. So if you do like a simple 128 byte thing, you might not see the DMA routines, well, you won't uh, fire and so forth. So just a, that's a specific example, but you, you do need to know some of the characteristics uh, of what's going on underneath to kind of understand what, how that got translated into the real world, okay? from those abstracted APIs. The, um, the other big thing, and we kind of touched on that already, is you need to know where to use sync versus async, okay? So I said network drivers, um, typically that are already driving off of callbacks where they're recycling SKBs and so forth. Um, you already have that model where you're optimizing for throughput, so you typically use asyncs there. You don't. You don't care exactly when it goes, but as long as it just uh, completes and you can do your housekeeping off of the, uh, the callbacks, okay? Um, but you're gonna have some latency there, right? Um, with the synchronous, okay, um, one, of the, one of the nice things now, and I don't, when, which kernel did that come in? Yeah. That, where it, where it tries to do immediate in, in yeah, early 4X. Yeah, yeah, I it was too lazy to go run git and check it, but <laughs> it was somewhere in there. It's like four or one or something, it's really old. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, old unless you're on some crappy vendor kernel from. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a kind of dead in state, but it must be old. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So the point there is, if you're on a newer kernel, or if you're stuck on an older one, there's some great optimizations in there where you wanna have very low latency. It will try to execute in caller context and you can avoid uh, um, uh, a, a context switch, right? And you avoid the sleep and reduce latency. Um, now, here's the eye chart. I want everybody to see this and probably somebody would take a patch to maybe get it in the docs itself, but I always found, I had to explain this to a couple people before, you will find this in include Linux spy spy.h, but the, the, um, the spy overview docs are a little bit more terse about this behavior, and, and this is very, very good, okay? One of the optimization things when you're working on, on protocol drivers is that you wanna be very careful about the behavior of the chip select because the back end controller often will have a very long delay um, if your, your chip select is unasserted and then you do another transfer and it's got to reassert it, okay? Um, and it can handle just having the chip select asserted the whole time. You can, you can change some flags uh, in the transfer to keep, keep that asserted all the time. There's default case, and so you, you use CS change to do that. This is where you can go read the full explanation of that, okay? Um, and also you can use it as a hint that um, if, if you're dispatching a lot of transfers, right, um, you can have a hint that the next transfer is going to the same device and so it doesn't have to drop the chip select. That can save you, if you go look at it on your logic analyzer or scope, it can save you a lot of time, right, in, in between those. So when you're optimizing, you need to be aware of these things. All right, um, quick thing on, tour, on, on tools and then we're done. Um, uh, you want a logic analyzer? Go take, it, the, take a look at these things. SIGROC has a great, great comparison of everything and, and what it supports, and it's pretty comprehensive. Um, the SPY loopback test uh, module um, is, is a nice little uh, tester. Um, if you want to look at your performance with something that's a canned test, um, and, uh, and then the, the SPY subsystem statistics that came in a couple years ago or so, um, really great stuff. You'll find them under, under uh, 
you know, your bus dot chip select statistics. And what's great about those is when you're thinking about that spy sync stuff, right? And did, did I actually, uh, how many times am I actually sleeping, right? Or actually executing in the context of the caller? You start having visibility of that per device, right? By you see how many messages you sent, transfers you sent. Oh, how many times I did spy sync immediate, right? Which executed in my caller context versus how many times did I did I fall asleep, right? Um, timeouts, so forth. And then this is really awesome. There's a histogram um, uh, sysfs attributes now, so you have buckets of size of transfers, so you can actually look and see with a histogram what your um, data looks like. So that'll help you out a lot when you're optimizing. All right, last thing, future um, slave support is coming. Um, and um, it's useful in some limited use cases because we have the hard real-time um, nature of slave support where it's a full duplex bus and you're gonna have to respond with something as soon as you get that first bit clocked in, right? And so a lot of cases you can't do, but um, you can do things with pre-existing responses, um, things that are just a one-way command to your Linux system. So Geert Dieterhoven has a RFC V2 patch series. He's working on some bug fixes. Um, and he's got a couple examples in that um, where um, he has um, basically when you register a slave, um, you get this sysclass um, slave device. You can, at runtime, um, uh, bind a slave protocol driver into that slave controller. And he's got two example ones, one that, that does uh, latest uptime, that it's got pre-existing cached, and it can respond back with a, a time um, packet, and another one where he can power off, reboot, halt the system, just one-way commands. So that's coming. I think he's got a new version coming soon. Real soon now, I put him on the spot. That's it. So I, I think we do have time for a question. If uh, people could be courteous to Matt, who's given us a great talk. Hopefully we can uh, be still just for this one question. If there is one, go ahead. 